All right. Well, Monique, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, it's good to see a full room of young people here, all cheerful. Uh, you know, usually when I talk to people doing media, they tend to be older and far less cheerful. And uh, now I understand that they're probably less cheerful for very good reasons. Um, so uh, let me try to start by giving you something of an overview of where I think the world is today, and particularly how technology, and especially four or five big technology firms, fit into that picture, and also why the internet or social media as such, they're not really a threat in themselves, and I think it would be a mistake to think of them as a threat. But the power of these firms, and the way in which they increasingly run the economy, society, politics, and so forth, has to be questioned. It has to be questioned critically, it has to be questioned by academics, but also has to be questioned by journalists. And I would argue that over the last 20 years, journalists and academics have failed in that function. They have failed to grapple with the political and economic dimension of the technology industry. They have failed to ask critical questions about where its wealth and its power comes from. And they have failed to ask questions about what the ultimate consequences of that immense concentration of power and resources in the hands of just four or five big firms would be. I hope I would eventually get into the question of fake news, post-truthiness, um, and um, a few other themes that you'll be discussing uh, during the event. But I think nonetheless, it's very important for you to have this broader social, political, and to some extent historical picture of why we are where we are now, because ultimately it's only by grasping this historical and political nature of our current predicament that we would be able to understand why fake news, for example, is a problem that cannot just be solved through some kind of technological intervention. Right? I've written my uh, last book about what I call solutionism. Right? It's this idea that you can easily find a technological fix technological solution to every single political, social, and economic problem out there, right? And I think it's very tempting now, as we are faced with this uh, rage about the rise of fake news, the rise of sites that more or less traffic in erroneous information, to go for some kind of technical solution, right? And the technology firms will be the first ones to offer it. As you see, Facebook, Google, and others, Twitter, they're the ones that are actually jumping on the opportunity to further integrate themselves in our society, to build fact-checking mechanisms, to build all sorts of fact-checking institutions, and to more or less provide the kind of solution that's highly technological, that's going to unsolve or undo the problem that I would argue is deeply political and economical. So that's a very long prelude. Let me start with an anecdote and a fact that I think will prompt some questions also in your heads as to how much power these firms have accumulated. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, at the beginning of May, uh, all big American firms, including the technology firms, have released their earnings statements. Right? They do it every quarter, because this is what's required by law. So every quarter you have to report your earnings statements, and usually when you report a good, healthy profit, your stock prices goes up. Right? So it's very basic, rudimentary economics. So, what do you think was the increase in the total value on the stock market of just four big firms, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix, since the beginning of the year? Right? So think about this question again. What is the total increase right, in just four months of the total stock market value of just four big American technology companies? Google, Facebook, Netflix, and Amazon. Take a guess in billions, millions, whatever number you would like to throw at me. So take a peek. By how much did they grow in total? Billion. Two billion. Okay, one. You can't, you can't be Googling right now. So anybody who is Googling, I'll, 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 I will dismiss. Okay, we have a range here from two billion to 200 billion. Uh, anyone else? How much? Okay, so trillions, you'll say. Uh, good. So uh, the actual increase in their value, right? And you also have, before I give you the answer, you have to understand how it works, right? I mean, you can only 
have a huge increase in market value, if the markets expect that you're doing very well, right? So if the markets think that you know you're doing better than everyone expects, people start buying your stock, your stock goes up, that basically boosts your value. Right? So it would be very hard for companies to increase their value by two, two trillion because it would mean that they're making far more money than anybody ever expected in just four months. Right? So more or less, that's the mechanics of it. So these four firms have raised their market capitalization value by 250 billion right? in just four months. Right? Think about it, what it means. Right? It means that if you bought a share in all four of them, right? Uh, your share would be worth far more <laughs> than it was at the beginning of the year, right? Because their value has more or less increased by an immense amount. Right? You can calculate if you start with the actual stock value what it means in terms of percentages. But to me, this suggests that there are two or three possible explanations for this immense increase. Right? And you also have to keep in mind that the fact that they, their value has increased by $250 billion over the course of just four months does not mean that they have actually earned all this money. Right? A company like Amazon actually has been consistently losing money for the last 20 years. So Amazon does not earn money to its shareholders. They do not distribute dividends. Amazon basically is a money losing operation which does not mean that they do not sell stuff. As you shop from them, they deliver a lot of goods, they have a huge turnover, they have a lot of sales, right? But those sales do not translate into profits, right? And yet, Amazon is one of those four firms whose market value has increased by $250 billion. Right? There is something of a paradox here, right? Which we need to be able to explain, right? And I would argue that there are just two or three perspectives on this paradox, right? One is to basically say that there is nothing to worry about here and everything in what has been happening so far is quite benign, right? These firms, they have a healthy growth model, they keep expanding, they keep growing, they keep entering new markets, they will one day enter fully India, they will one day fully enter China, and all of this more or less figures just reflect a healthy growth of a sector. Right? And we as a society should not worry at all because ultimately those companies make us rich, they more or less trickle down the money that they earn to investors, pension funds, you name it. Okay? Um, there is another perspective which is quite radically different from the one I have just outlined, which will tell you that we are in the middle of another stock bubble. Right? Most of you are too young to remember that probably. But there was a big tech stock bubble in 1999. Right? It burst and a lot of people lost a lot of money. Why? Because you had companies like Pets.com, which was basically a site for delivering dog food over the internet, right? which raised quite a lot of money. They were valuable on the stock markets. Everybody wanted to buy their stock because they thought they would make billions. Overnight, those markets collapsed. People have lost billions. Right? So there is another school of thought that will tell us that these companies just are preparing us for disaster. Ultimately, markets will collapse. It's all just irrational exuberance. So just as we have seen a financial crisis in 2007, 2008, built around housing, high prices, speculative bubble around housing, we are gonna see another bubble like this around technology. Right? I would argue that both of those perspectives are actually incorrect. Right? And that there is a way for us to acknowledge that the numbers and the immense expectations that markets place on those firms, that those numbers actually reflect what the markets expect those companies to do, which is to more or less penetrate every single sector of society and become a key intermediary in every one of them. So Amazon will not just be selling books, it will be selling furniture, it will be selling food, it will be selling uh, access to transportation, logistics, web services, and so forth. And it's actually already selling all of those things. In many of their markets, especially in the United States, they even operate physical bookstores. Right? Who would have thought that a company like Amazon, that was started essentially to sell books online, would actually want to enter uh, an industry such as bookstores? And nonetheless, they did. Right? And you can make the same argument about Google, that ultimately the reason why the markets are betting so much on the growth and expansion of those firms 
is because they have understood by just looking at what Google does, is that it's no longer a firm that just offers you an email service. It's no longer a firm just that offers you search or YouTube videos. It's also a firm that increasingly penetrates areas like healthcare, right? Where they have a lot of projects, where they are trying to do things like life extension, where they are trying to cure cancer. Uh, they're entering domains like energy, where they're trying to understand how much electricity you're using in your house, operating all sorts of thermostats and so forth. It's a company that enters transportation because they have their own autonomous vehicles unit, which basically seeks and has already built actually quite a few self-driving cars. Right? It's more or less, it's a company that wants to be everywhere, including possibly space travel. Right? So there is hardly a domain or an industry that this firm doesn't want to dominate. You can make a similar argument about Facebook and so forth. Right? And the optimistic case, which I have outlined before for this, would be to say that there is nothing to worry about. These firms are very efficient. So far, they have not shown us any negative side to their operations. Ultimately, they're benevolent. Those of you have, who have used Google or Facebook or any of those firms, and I'm sure that that applies virtually to all of you in this room, know that it's not the image of a tradi traditional kind of very vulgar, very profit-oriented capitalist firm that would like to screw you, extract as much money from you, and more or less trick you into doing something really bad. Right? If you think about Google, your relationship with them is very different. First of all, and that's the most radical departure from traditional business practice, they do not charge you for their services. Right? Their services are free. Right? This is actually a radical departure from what companies usually do. So when you use Google, YouTube, uh, Gmail, and so forth, it's as if someone else was paying, paying for it, it's not you, right? Um, that's one thing. Second thing is that it's not obvious why we should be fearful as these firms take over other sectors of society because they promise us so much more efficiency than traditional operators. And everybody thinks that as Google takes over transportation, they're going to avoid accidents, right? Because as cars become autonomous and self-driving, you can actually build a world where you'll actually have the number of accidents reduced. What's not to like about that, right? If you can think about companies like Uber and many others, they allow you to use your existing resources very efficiently. So you can use one car, right? And by relying on sensors, located in various parts of the city, very often embedded into our own cell phones and mobile phones, you would be able to use the same car to make trips that previously required 10 cars to make. So from the perspective of environmentalism, right, this again is a very positive development. You can actually use existing resources more efficiently, thus you can actually contribute to addressing many of the problems with climate change and so forth. And then you can go on the list of many of these features and you would think that ultimately, and this is a fantastic model, right? that we should not worry about that. These companies can continue growing in size. They can continue entering more and more domains. They can continue entering more and more industries, disrupting them, extracting all the value. None of that matters. Because ultimately, once they take over an industry, the efficiency gains they introduce not only help us fight climate change or road accidents, they also make services cheaper. And that's ultimately one of the killer arguments, because you can actually start offering services by exploiting all of the efficiencies that come from digitization and informationalization of services to offer services at prices that are either very low or non-existent. Right? So that's why a company like Uber, they would claim, if you have heard about it or used it, I think it's not legal everywhere in Europe, including in the Netherlands, uh, you would actually know that Uber will charge you probably less than a traditional taxi. So for many customers, that's actually a positive. Now, let me try to show to you what is wrong with this picture, okay? which is not to deny that there are some environmental benefits, that there are some efficiency benefits, there are some safety benefits, and there are some cost benefits. I think all of those are real. Right? They're not necessarily fake right now. Right? The question has to be how long that can continue, right? How long can this windfall of savings 
windfall of efficiency, how long it can continue. And my argument would be that it cannot continue forever. Sooner or later, you're going to face rising prices. Okay? Sooner or later, you're going to see new types of services being developed for which only those firms would be able to more or less provide, thus giving them even more power to dictate the terms and conditions under which we'll operate. And that will more or less change the political and economic rhythms, if you will, of democracy as such. So let me unpack this rather abstract uh, statement. So if you look at a company like Uber, for example, right, how is Uber able to offer prices that are so much lower than the traditional taxi industry. Right? You would think that all of that comes, in fact, from the exploitation of information, sensors, algorithms, and so forth. But that's only part of the story. Right? The real answer is that Uber is a company that has one model. Right? They call themselves a platform. Right? And platform means that you can expand almost infinitely, right? indefinitely, into different countries, to different cities, and it wouldn't cost you much to do so because software is the same everywhere. So once it works in Boston, it will work in Bangalore, right? That more or less is the idea of a platform, that once you have a platform, you can scale it indefinitely, sign up millions and millions of users, and you'll be able to make a lot of cash, right? But ultimately, this model works only if you manage to dominate the market globally, destroy everybody, more or less, right? And more or less run the taxi transportation system. That's the expectation of the investors that give Uber money right now. So Uber is a company that's worth, by recent evaluation, somewhere between 60 to $80 billion. It's quite a high valuation for a startup. It's actually the world's most valuable startup, right? What accounts for such a high valuation? Exactly what I've said before. The expectation of the investors is that they will come and crash every single competitor in every single market where they operate. And they'll be the only service provider of taxis and transportations in the Netherlands, in uh, Germany, in India, in Brazil, wherever they operate. Right? That more or less is why investors expect it to be so valuable. Right? And they can be. But you have to understand that the only reason why that currently is possible right? It's because they are raising quite a lot of money from big investors like Goldman Sachs, which has given them quite a lot of money, and the government of Saudi Arabia. So what happens is that you actually have these big firms, right? They manage to raise a lot of money from foreign investors. And then they come into a local market and they can start offering their services at prices that are very, very low, right? Which no other competitor can actually match. All the competitors quietly die and disappear and more or less uh, with their way. And once those competition is gone, which might take a year, which might take three years, which might take five years, they can raise the prices back again so that they can pay off all of their investors. Right? That's the magic and the trick of a company like Uber. So the idea that somehow the low prices that you get are going to be there forever, I think it's a mirage. Right? It's a delusion. But that is not the most important point. What you have to understand when you look at a company like Google is that the reason why so many of its services are free right, is very simple. Google has understood that more or less advertising is not going to carry them forward forever. Right? So if you look at how Google has made so much money, it has in fact been through advertising. Right? They have managed to come up with a model that has disrupted the traditional advertising sales model of mainstream media which has collapsed the media in the meantime, more or less blocking their revenue sources and pushing them to concentrate on chasing eyeballs and generating uh, funny headlines to attract traffic, which to some extent explains the rise in fake news and uh, post-truthfulness and whatnot. But what has also happened is that it has become obvious to Google that in the process of building this advertising-focused business model, they have managed to create a system for building the most advanced and robust form of artificial intelligence. And I think this is very important to understand. So the reason why we can have self-driving cars now right, is very simple. Object recognition has become so good that you can actually have an automated system decide whether an object in front of it is a car, a tree, a human being, or a cat. Right? That was not possible 20 years ago. 
on a large scale and at a fast speed. Why has it become possible now? You know, and we are looking not at some science fiction scenario of self-driving cars being on the roads in 10 or 20 years. We already have states where self-driving cars are already on the roads, and most likely self-driving trucks will be on the roads within the next two or three years. I mean, they're already on the roads, it's just that commercially they'll be on the roads. So they'll actually be displaying truck drivers. You know that truck drivers usually, no matter what country you look at, usually it's one of the top three professions in terms of actual employment. For example, in America, truck drivers is the single largest profession by employment. 3.5 million people are employed in truck driving. Once you automate truck driving, you have 3.5 people 3.5 million people who are unemployed. Okay? So that's an additional problem, which of course we need to grapple with. But ultimately the reason why we have made so much progress in artificial intelligence, which has allowed us to be able to automate driving, but has also allowed us to do a lot of other things with health, education, I'll give you a few more examples, is that Google has built a system through its consumer platforms for search, for YouTube, for Gmail and so forth, that more or less relies on the labor of all of us, millions, billions of users, to train the system and to make it smart. So with every single click, right, with every single YouTube video, with every single decision, what link to click and what link not to click, you are actually training the system, right? In a way that you, know, you can actually understand if you study deep learning, if you study uh, you know, the, the distributed uh, neural networks and so forth, but not getting too much into the science, that more or less is the mechanism, right? It's millions and billions of users who, in a distributed manner, are training the system to become smart, right? So it's us. It's not some kind of major revolution in computer science that has made the system so smart as it is now. If that really is the case, right, then you have to be asking a question, whether Google actually is getting a much better deal by offering many of its services to us for free, right? where the supposed terms of exchange are quite clear and explicit than we have thought before. So what is the deal according to which we are getting the service now? The deal is very simple. They show us an ad, we see an ad, we click on a link, we get a service. Right? We don't click on the link on the net, we still get a service. What counts is exposure. And everybody thinks that that's a fair deal because ultimately we get a service in exchange for our attention because we're being shown the net. What you do not see is that behind that exchange, there is a hidden extraction of value from us, the users, that then contributes to teaching the system to be smart. Eventually, if you happen to be a truck driver, depriving you of a job down the road. Right? That more or less is the deal. And that is the deal that you can see across the board at large. It's not just in truck driving. You can look at healthcare, where Google has struck a deal with the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, where Google is basically coming and analyzing health records of more than 3 million patients to see advanced signs of um, early symptoms of kidney disease. Right? So if Google has access to 3.5 million health records, and they can analyze all of them, right? they can actually predict with very good likelihood who is likely to get some kind of a health problem with their kidney and when. Right? Which completely redefines the relationship between doctors and patients, doctors and hospitals, doctors and Google and so forth. Down the line, it's very hard to imagine why a lot of jobs that are still performed by humans now will require any humans in the process whatsoever. Right? That also means that firms like Google, Facebook, and so forth right, will more or less be the only ones who are still capable of actually providing that service. Right? And you can think about it along many, many different examples. If you look at the recent series of cyber attacks that has just hit computers everywhere right, and has frozen computer networks and now extracts payment, the only way to start defending ourselves from cyber attacks like this one, is in fact to start leveraging artificial intelligence to be able to understand which attacks count as serious, which doesn't count as serious, right? So in a very kind of quasi-academic parlance, if you will, these companies manage to have a resource around which they can start extracting rent, 
because that resource is unique and they're the only ones who hold it. Okay? So in the case of Google, in the case of Facebook, in the case of Amazon and so forth, they managed to own the kind of digital infrastructure that in the past we would associate with other exclusive resources. Think about land, right? Traditionally, from history we know, that whoever manages to control land, right, or some type of economic resource, natural resources you can think about, oil, right? These people happen to be extremely powerful and they can set and dictate the terms to the rest of society. They can charge you whatever they want because they manage to control land. They can charge you whatever they want because they manage to control oil. Right? This is not a market where there is any kind of competition that can drive down the price. Right? And I think that one thing that you have to keep in mind, right? as you kind of go through the week and as you then continue your studies is that at this point, data is that resource, right? As the rest of the society gets transformed around data, right? Data becomes a resource that more or less makes or breaks a democracy, a political regime, an enterprise and so forth. Once the most useful and valuable resource of a society ends up owned just by four or five, let me specify again, American firms. And they have nothing to do with Europe, they have nothing to do with Asia, they have nothing to do with any of the other geographical re regions. You end up in a situation that looks much more like feudalism than actually like capitalism. Right? And I think that this is something that we have to understand. That ultimately, unless we manage to tra trace back the value chain, of how value is generated, how it's extracted, and how then it's being used to dictate society, terms to society elsewhere, whether it's in health or in education and transportation and elsewhere, we will continue celebrating the very forces that are coming here to destroy your job, your lifestyle, and your political regime. Right? And this is where journalism and media should have been doing the job that they haven't done at all in the last 20 years. And this is where critical questions about the value chain should have been asked. Critical questions about the political power of this industry should have been asked and they weren't. Right? So one message I would like to leave you with before we move to the Q&A, and hopefully you will you'll, you'll be able to discuss that more during question time, is you have to be able to leave whatever positive biases you have of this industry aside you have to be able to look at the fundamental economics of what makes that industry so valuable. And you have to think, using historical analogies of some kind, to understand what happens when so much power is concentrated in the hands of just four and five firms. Throughout history, you'll see examples that nothing good happens <laughs> after that power concentration has happened. So, okay, I'll stop here and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa. I have a lot of questions, but this is not my time to ask questions, it's your time to ask questions. And again, for some of you, you might not be used to standing up in a room full of people and asking your questions in English. There are no wrong questions. And if anything, at the end of these four days, you're going home, you say like, you know what? I can stand up and ask questions, if anything. So who is the first one? Who wants to ask a question? I'm, I'm going to... No, not Frank. No, no, no. Not, not us. The students. A student that want to ask a question. Yes, you. Go ahead. There's a, there's a, 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 speak into this thing. Wow. It's the yeah. first time I see it. Very you. awkward. Hello. Yeah, no, that works. All that right. works. So you were talking value chain. That the, 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 their value chain is what makes them like have a strategy in the end, right? That is... Um, uh, that makes them predict the, the future a little more. And, oh wait, just one way. I can't think because the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, say it, I'll repeat it. Go ahead, go ahead. Right? Just say the question, I'll repeat it. Don't worry. I have no idea what I'm going to say. You're going to have to say it in Dutch and you'll translate them in something. Yes. It's called the value chain in the end, right? And the idea that I was thinking about is more like a strategy, right? The value chain is how they construct their uh, future a little more, but it's also very much strategic choices, right? And those data, so what I'm thinking, oh, later on we'll be able to create a self-driving car with this whole uh, self-taught uh, uh, thing called YouTube, right? Uh -huh. And um, so would you not call it 
strategy rather than strategy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, sure. But, uh, I mean, these, these, as you described, these four companies or five companies, uh, they they can paint a pretty positive picture of where they're going. Sure. Um, and there are aspects that can only be realized when mm. you have massive scale. So it's not like mm. you could say, oh, just break them up into small things and it will sure. still happen. Is there anything we can do? I mean, it depends on how radical you want to be. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do. I mean, there are a lot of bad things you can do. I mean, I, again, I'm against the idea of trying to fight this by breaking firms into smaller units. I mean, ultimately, there is something to information that makes it into a kind of a resource that works only at scale. So, you know, when you're ordering pizza on your phone, right, it's far better than whoever delivers your pizza knows your location. So you don't want to separate your location from your order and have five different companies handle different parts of who you are. In that sense, you know, Google has had a genius strategy, right, because they actually work by penetrating every single uh, life activity of yours and integrating all the data, just that I'm not sure that doing it at the level of the firm is the right idea. What I would like to do is to have a regime, can be a legal regime, right, where a lot of the data that has a public value to it are not privately owned at all, which does not mean that you cannot build commercial services on top of that data, but it does mean that it's not something that can just be appropriated with some kind of enclosure erected around it and people who would also like to use the data are excluded from it, if not legally, then at least by the fact that they just don't have the resources to analyze that data, which is how it works now. Okay. So uh, we have to be able to experiment with different legal models. We also have to be able to think beyond just the usual European answer to this is that, you know, we've managed to build an Airbus to America's Boeing, so we also need to build a European Google to America's Google. I think that's not going to unseat Google, but it's also not the right way to make information more useful to citizens. Right? So opening up the data would be one, one way to go. Uh, other questions from the room? And thank you very much, by the way, for asking the first question. I, mean, I know Frank has a question, but let's... Another student. Yes. Be brave. I, I, I just came back from a research trip to Shenzhen, China. I've never been there before in my life. Very impressive. But um, there, uh, I mean, here we still have Facebook and Google and Netflix and they're separate companies. Mm -hmm. But there, there's WeChat and it's one company that basically is incredibly useful. We use it to, to translate, to pay, to order, to reserve things. To, mm -hmm. There, it's even more concentrated into one. Oh, company. it's not true. I mean, they have four or five firms, including Alibaba and many others, and so. Yeah, but yeah, the the, the government there knows more. Even well, but again, I mean, uh, you have to understand that. I mean, uh, you have to be able to think critically about information. Thinking critically about information does require, as I've said, taking a very critical stance towards those firms. You have to be ask. You have to be able to ask a very simple question. Why on earth is a company like Google that is, if you look at ratings, you know, they do those ratings, they look at how consumers think about companies, right? So usually big, giant, polluting oil companies come at the bottom because everybody knows they're giant, polluting, and bad, while companies like Google come on top. So Google always comes on top. They have m more positive rating than any single government and any single other entity probably out there. Yet, they're the company that spends as much on lobbying in Washington and Brussels as Goldman Sachs. And you have to be able to start asking critical questions, even the question that the fact that I gave you at the beginning of the talk. A company that has grown by so much in just four months, right? How come a company like that still enjoys such a favorable public rating, right? We have to be able to understand that how their power influences not just the media, think tanks, and so forth, but how it influences academia. 90% of all the research on privacy in universities in America and Europe is funded by Google, right? Which tells you also why so much of that research is so positive about Google, right? And those, you know, when you had big oil firms in the US, you had Standard Oil, you had John Rockefeller, you had those oil barons, right? Uh, Robert Barons, who were more or less perceived as bad guys. Quite justifiably so. You had a new breed of journalists, right? the so-called muckrackers, who would go and report on the practices of those firms, expose them, show how bad, evil, and corrupt they are. It was far easier to do with oil firms. 
It's much harder to do with companies like Google, Facebook, and so forth. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Right? I think it's actually a very nice challenge to journalists, to storytellers, to narrative makers, to be able to come up with a narrative that will actually make people aware that it's not just about you know, making our life easier, hassle-free, efficient, and so forth. All of that is correct. Right? But also being able to link some of the consequences of the rise of those firms, including the giant economic inequality that we're all observing, to the fact that you know, so much wealth is concentrated in just one sector. The fact that these companies grow by $250 billion in just four months, right? that probably does have something to do with the fact that so and more and more of us feel disempowered, feel that you know, we are not earning our share. Right? And that connection is not done often enough. We keep blaming Goldman Sachs, you know, Wall Street, and so forth, and we should. But we should be able to understand that right now, as capitalism itself becomes digitized, we have to be able to tell a different story that's a little bit newer and that's a little bit less banal about you know, just a bunch of financiers extracting value from everything. That story we already know. I'm going to give Frank the word here. Question from Frank. Uh, yeah, I had a question, I think, that was kind of already answered, but I have another question, going back to the 250 um, billion. Yes. We had this opening video, mm -hmm. and you haven't seen it, but Beppe Grillo, an Italian politician, said, the people are the right. No, the people are, they are not right, they are the right themselves, the reason themselves. Mm -hmm. So, if a stock value of a company increases by 250 billion, wouldn't you then say that the people have spoken, and this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that, that, that would... <laughs> go on, go on, go on. Ignore me. <laughs> to say that would be to assume that, you know, the kind of highly institutionalized, financialized capitalism that we have now is actually democratic, which is exactly how a lot of social democratic regimes in the 1970s were selling it to us, especially in the Netherlands, where the idea was that you know, once you have pension funds that can start investing in everything, it will actually bring uh, decision-making power closer to citizens. You know, that was not just here in, in the UK and elsewhere, that was the rationale. And now we discover ourselves in a situation where a lot of the institutions that actually manage our own money, including pension funds, have become one of the most predatory uh, speculative investors out there. By national laws, they often prevent it from investing into their own country. So in Canada, for example, right, these have become the largest institutional investors in the world, like Canadian pension funds. By law, they are prevented from investing in the Canadian economy because everybody knows that the last thing you want is a Canadian pension fund investing in you because they act just like Goldman Sachs. They come and extract value, right? According to a logic that has very little to do with, you know, like providing decent pension to people, right? This has everything to do with more or less meeting your 8% annual return, right? So I don't buy the idea that people actually have a say in how those companies are run. Just look at the IPO, the initial public offering of a company called Snap, which you know some of you might be using. It's product Snapchat, right? So Snapchat, if you look at the, IP, the actual structure of the stock offering of Snap, investors have no vote. You can buy a share, you have no vote whatsoever in how the company is run, right? So, and that has always been one of the ways in which capitalism legitimized its power, right? The idea was that not only can you trade stock, right, in the market, but you can actually exercise some power. If you accumulate some stock, you can, you know, through shareholding institutions, the board of directors, you can actually have a say in how the company is governed. If you look at all of the technology firms, from Google to Facebook to Snap, shareholders come for nothing. If anything, it's a system that's far less democratic than anything else. But the idea that somehow people have a say in how big institutional investors place their bets. You know, what the people of Saudi Arabia have to say when the government of Saudi Arabia and, and other sovereign wealth funds place their money in Uber. I mean, most of that cash comes from sovereign wealth funds, which are usually countries with lots of oil and very few democratic institutions attached to how that oil revenue is spent. <laughs> we, 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 have, yes. <laughs> we have very little time. I was really just curiosity. Um, you might not know, but Uber actually has decided <coughs> to move its international headquarters to Amsterdam. Yeah, and its design, reason, the design it's design department was here already. <laughs> exactly. But, you know. oh. um, you've been looking at these developments all these years. Have you not ever thought like, okay, you know, I'm just going to buy some shares here and there? Because you, know, you see what's happening. 
the multiplication of value. Mm. Did, did you invest yourself? No. No? <laughs> oh, I just never had that thought until now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never invested anything in my life, but I can remember when Amazon went public and the shares were fifteen dollars. I thought, like, oh, well, fifteen dollars, yeah. I could buy one. And I the problem is that if you don't take any money from Google to do a research, you have nothing to invest. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, these are young people, full of hope. Life is in front of them. Where should they focus their attention if they want to change something in this world? Well, is there something we can do as individuals or together? Because it, we seem to be up against something so big mm -hmm. that we half the time don't even understand what's going on. And this, mm -hmm. secondly, we can't do a lot. Well, I mean, I, be cautious against easy way out, right? And I think it's very easy to think that if you just move to a different platform, just move to a different product, if now you start using an equivalent of Uber that has a fair trade logo, stamped on it, then somehow things will get better or things will get different. I think we have to be very conscious and cognizant of the ways in which many of those firms offer us easy, pseudo-ethical ways to get out. But ultimately, I think you, know, you have to understand what hurts them the most, if that's really what you want to do. And, and this is where you know, the power of narratives, the power of trying to tell a different story in a way that will be understood, I think is key. So, you know, learn to think abstractly and holistically, because ultimately, if you just bind this very micro paradigm that, you know, it's a fair deal, they give us a service, we pay with our attention, there is nothing in between, right? It's, a, it's how microeconomics kind of functions now. Right? If you buy into that paradigm, you will never be able to understand how value is generated, right? So being able to think holistically, being able to ask critical historical questions is good. But anyway, I mean, there is, let me tell you this, there are no good reasons whatsoever to be optimistic or hopeful. <laughs> and if you are feeling optimistic or hopeful, it just means you're not reading enough news. So I, read I news. Fear we're not, yeah, I fear. <laughs> well, Yevgeny, thank you so much. <laughs> sure. <laughs>